So good morning, everybody. Let's at, uh, us continue with uh, where we had left off uh, last uh, lecture. We were going through a number of um, aspects of compositions of steels. I was trying to uh, make clear to you that we are, um, when we deal with steels, there are actually a, only a handful of elements that we, that we use in the composition of, of uh, the steel to achieve certain effects. And um, so we already discussed last time how molybdenum and chromium have a big impact on the transformation. Uh, there are two more elements uh, that um, I want to uh, discuss um, in some detail. Um, there's a boron and, and niobium, very different effects they have, but um, um, let's, let's see what they do and, uh, and why we add them. So um, on the, the graph you see, uh, on the slide, excuse me, you see a, a basic uh, iron carbon diagram with 0% of Niobia, right? You see here the ACM line, the A, uh, or the AE3 temperature, excuse me, and here the eutectoid uh, temperature. And you see that as we add niobium, 0.002%, 0.005%, so 20, 50% of niobium, we get a, uh, a shrinking of the austenite stability phase. So it is uh, a ferrite stabilizer. Um, so that's one thing uh, we see here. Um, however, uh, we, uh, when we use um, boron, we actually don't uh, exploit this uh, boron stabilizing uh, effect of uh, that element, but we use it for something different. This is what actually happens when you add boron to a steel. Uh, so let me first tell you what, what you're seeing on this uh, picture here. So um, what you see, just uh, follow the uh, pointer here, you see here grain boundaries or what uh, uh, used to be grain boundaries uh, of in austenite, yes? And um, what uh, you did was done with this uh, steel is it was basically cooled from austenite uh, through the transformation and through the uh, to start the transformation, and then it was suddenly cooled. So just in case you uh, don't understand uh, what uh, directly what I've said, or just to make sure there is no misunderstanding. So you have uh, fully austenitic uh, steel, hmm, which you cool to this uh, position, yes? And is it its first step, yes? Uh, you wait a little bit at this point, yes, and then you you quench very rapidly to room temperature. Mm -hmm. And as you quench, you pass the martensite start temperature of the austenite that is not yet transformed. So normally, uh, if you do this, your austenite grains will uh, transform to ferrite, yes, because when you go from here to here, you go to the two-phase region, yes? And uh, so the uh, ferrite will form at triple points and at edges, yes? Will nucleate there, yes? And grow. Hmm? Hmm? So nucleation and grow. Hmm? However, um, and, and then when you uh, cool down, you let the transformation proceed a little bit and then you uh, suddenly stop it, yes, and quench it, what you see is that the uh, remaining austenite that has not yet transformed becomes martensite, yeah? Now what happens if you do this with a steel that contains boron, you don't see this, but what you see instead is that you form 
ferrite in the interior of the austenite, yes? And if you quench the material here, what you see is that this, the rest of the grains forms martensite. So this, this trick of quenching rapidly and transforming the austenite that has not transformed yet to martensite um, is a way to visualize what happens at high temperature. And this uh, micrograph tells me that something is amiss with the nucleation stage. That normal nucleation is at grain boundaries, and when I have boron, there is no more nucleation at the grain boundaries. Yes? Instead, you see there is very little nucleation inside the matrix, and I can tell it's very little nucleation because I have these huge ferrite grains rather than many small ferrite grains. Yes? So I suppress the nucle nucleation of ferrite at the grain boundary, and in other words, I suppress ferrite formation. Yes? And that is one of the uh, reasons why we use uh, boron uh, is because we achieve this uh, very efficient suppression of uh, ferrite nucleation at very low concentrations of boron, very, very low, yeah? a few ppm. Hmm? 10 to 20 ppm, the effect is already very visible at 10 to 20 ppm's of boron. Hmm? So remember that means 0 0.0010, 10 to the minus 4, 10, might, 10 times to the minus 4, mass percents or weight percents of boron. Hmm? Okay? Um, uh, uh, right, so this, is a, this example was for 20 ppm of boron. And, and this is then what you see if you look at a TTT diagram. So remember TTT diagram, I do an isothermal transformation. So I do uh, this test here. I, I go from this austenite range to this uh, ferrite plus <coughs> austenite range. If I do this uh, without boron, I simple carbon manganese steels, hmm? 0.2 carbon, 1.6 manganese steels. I see uh, these are the lines for 2, 10, 20, and 50% of transformation for ferrite. Hmm? So basically, if I do the transformation at, say, 600 degrees C, it takes me, um, uh, this is 10, this is 20 seconds to uh, have 2% transformation. Right? If I have a boron added uh, material here, 35% boron, uh, you can see that all these top lines here, the, the, the top line transformation uh, lines, segments of the transformation line, are now pushed back to longer temperatures. So you basically suppress the ferrite transformation, temp uh, the ferrite transformation uh, kinetics. Um, the reason why that happens is because the boron will uh, be at the grain boundaries of the austenite, yes? And suppress the nucleation of ferrite at this location. Hmm? Uh, and the boron is preferably in these grain boundaries. So the, even though the uh, concentration at uh, even though the, the nominal concentration of boron is a very low, because it's so strongly uh, enriched in the grain boundaries, um, the, um, the effective concentration, boron concentration in the grain boundary is, is very high. Hmm? Uh, I think uh, we can say today that the enrichment of the boron in grain bands is, is 100 to 150 times higher than the matrix concentration in the grain boundary. So, so 100, if I, mul if I, excuse me, not if I, if I multiply this with 100, yes, then the actual, um, or 150, as I just said, 
uh, I have uh, 0.15 the mass percent of boron at, in the grain boundary region, right? So a, uh, a lot more than, uh, am I saying this right? Uh, yes, 150,000, yeah. Um, so very high uh, uh, boron concentrations. Another element that is, um, just for your information, uh, boron uh, you will see mainly used in what we call engineering steels. So um, gears, um, gear parts, um, uh, uh, crankshafts, things like this, engineering uh, uh, Parts, just you know, the ones you you need to make a gearbox uh, and things like that. You'll see you 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 need this suppression of ferrite transformation um, uh, when you thermally treat these parts um, to achieve strength. Another element um, which is used very much in sheet products and plate products is niobium. And uh, because niobium ena enables, niobium enables what we call thermo-mechanical uh, processing of steels, of steel. Um, and, and very often we thermomechanically controlled processing is, is an alternative. So TMP or TMCP, TMP or TMCP, it's basically the same, uh, different word for the same uh, approach. Okay, what happens um, uh, when we add a little bit of niobium to, to steel? Now it's, it's very important in this case is that you add niobium to do thermomechanical processing. That means you are looking at the transformation of deformed austenite. So the boring effect that I just explained to you, uh, the growth of the ferrite is in recrystallized fer uh, austenite. Yes? So there's no deformation involved, you have a part it's heated up at high temperature, it's fully recrystallized, and you, you do the transformation. In the case of niobium, you're doing what's called thermomechanical processing. The transformation is from deformed austenite. So instead of having, uh, looking at the transformation of a recrystallized austenite, you now have a deformed microstructure and you're looking, you're interested in the transformation of this deformed microstructure. Now first of all let's, let's um, uh, say something about deforming steels, austenite, in the austenite temperature range, deforming it. What happens when you deform a metal at high temperature? It recrystallizes. Yes? And when you deform uh, iron, at high temperatures, say a thousand degrees, hmm, between thousand and nine hundred degrees hmm, in the austenite, it recrystallizes almost instantly. Yes, less than a second. So uh, very quickly. So it, this uh, structure doesn't persist for a very long time. So as soon as you deform it, it recrystallizes very rapidly. Hmm? Okay. Now, 
What niobium allows you to do, yes, is suppress the recrystallization of the deformed austenite. And why would you want to do this? Well, because you do this because you want to have the transformation occur from unrecrystallized or deformed austenite. That gives you, the, the end result is that this gives you a very, very strong grain refinement because there is a very high rate of nucleation. Okay, so let's just um, have, have a look at some graphs which um, illustrate this and then try to understand why, uh, why we observe the things we observe. So first of all, um, uh, I, I want to ask, do you have this picture? Some of you have uh, copied or, or printed out some, do you have this picture here? With, in, with, where this is in red and this is niobium free and this is with niobium? Because I think the earlier version or maybe the version I've posted had, was reversed with niobium free on this side. And so please, um, if, if your slides have this, you should revert them. So what we're basically looking at is uh, this is a transformation. The, the uh, solid line uh, shows you the transformation uh, kinetics, yeah, the CCT diagram for a uh, yeah, for a niobium free steel. Yeah. So uh, a steel that transforms from recrystallized austenite. When we add niobium, we can suppress the recrystallization. Yes, and the transformation now we see is accelerated. Yes, is accelerated. Hmm. Um, what happens? Um, well, there two processes are working. There are uh, there is a process of uh, which we call. Uh, solute drag, basically. It's um, related to niobium in solution. Yes. And we also have a process of deformation-induced precipitation of niobium carbides. So these two processes work together to suppress the recrystallization of the austenite. Let's first have a look at this um, um, precipitation of niobium carbide. Yeah. If we have recrystallized austenite like this, and we, we look at the what's called the precipitation time temperature diagram of niobium carbide, we, we get these solid these two C curves here for the static precipitation of niobium carbide. And you see that, for instance, at in the range of 1,000 to 900 degrees C, it takes me 100 seconds or more, to, slightly more, to start the precipitation of niobium carbide. And it takes a very long time before it's finished. Hmm? However, if I now have not recrystallized austenite, but deformed austenite, yeah, I see an acceleration of the precipitation. So now these two C curves, instead of uh, starting at 100 seconds, they start at one second or less. And what is more, precipitation is terminated before, after a few tens of seconds. So deformation has a very big impact on the uh, precipitation of the niobium carbide and a big effect on the formation of ferrite, yes? Okay. Let's, 
uh, say a few things about um, grain size. Why, why is grain size uh, so important? Why, why is the uh, refining of what is the effect of grain size in general on, on transformation? Hmm? So um, we will, in, in, in technology, uh, we'll see that we use this technique of progressively reducing the grain size, yes? And as we do this, we also see that the nucleation rate of, austen of ferrite will increase. Hmm? Hmm? So let's just um, look at this uh, schematic here, which, which is a TTT diagram for, say, the formation of ferrite from austenite. Right? And, and this uh, uh, dashed line here would be the start of the transformation for a, a relatively coarse microstructure. Hmm? So let's say uh, uh, the grain size is uh, D2 gamma, yes? This is a relatively coarse. And we look at the transformation, yes? We want to have an idea of what's the transformation rate now if I reduce the grain size. Hmm? For instance, uh, to D1 gamma, which is smaller than D2. Well, this nose <coughs> moves to the left. So the transformation is faster. Right? Um, and you can actually, um, if you have one transformation uh, rate, one TTT diagram at one uh, grain size, you can actually calculate very easily where the uh, where this C curve is for another grain size, because the the temperature, the, excuse me, the times hmm, the t at certain temperature, the time to get the same amount of transformation, yes, so the time T1 here is equal to the time T2 times the ratio of D1 over D2, hmm? and that is if D1 is smaller than D2, is smaller that is smaller than T2. So you'll have an acceleration. Just give, let me give you an example. If I have, if, if this is a transformation curve for 10 micron grain size, and I go to 5 micron grain size, then T1 is uh, D1, that's 5 over 10 times T2. So you have, uh, the time is half, half. Yes. So, um, and, and so, uh, Transformation, transforming from smaller grain sizes gives the, an acceleration of the transformation and a smaller grain size at the same time because you, the, trans, the, the acceleration is because you have much more nuclei of ferrite. Hmm? Nuclei. Many nuclei grow, uh, eventually they'll impinge on each other so their size will be smaller. Yes? Hmm? Okay. Right. Um, so, so that was what I want to say about grain size, the effect of grain size on the transformation, yes? What is the effect of um, uh, deformation, yes? Deformation on uh, the transformation. Well, we, we saw uh, two slides earlier that when, we, when you do the transformation from deformed austenite, rather than recrystallized austenite, the transformation nose moves to the left and moves upwards. So it, it's, it's, it's not only faster, but it's, it happens at an earlier, at a higher temperature. Why is that? Well, there are two effects. First of all, um, in the deformed microstructures, you have many defects areas, high defect areas, where you can form for instance, in this particular drawing, you have, for instance, shear bands, where, which are deformation bands, uh, where uh, you have, you will have nucleation of ferrite, additional nucleation of ferrite. So that is one. That is the reason why the nose moves to the left. You have a higher rate of nucleation. Yes. So you'll have. In this case, you only have nuclei here, yes? In this case, 
assu assuming it's the same grain that's deformed, you have, in addition to the nucleation here, you have nucleation inside the grains. Yeah? So, very high nucleation. Why do we get transformation at the higher temperature? Yes, that is because we have increased the free energy of the austenite. Yes, why do we have increased the free energy? Because all these defects here, yes, uh, uh, have some elastic energy, yes, uh, elastic energy, mechanical energy, and that increases the energy of the austenite. And, and you know that the driving force for the transformation is the difference in free energy between austenite and ferrite. When you deform the austenite, you increase the energy, the free energy of the austenite, and other, in other words, you increase the delta G, yes, the driving force for the transformation. So this is why the C curve moves left and up. Okay, And you can see this, again, by doing the trick I explained to you here, yes, where you let the transformation proceed for a certain amount of time and then quench the material suddenly. So what's the austenite that has not transformed will turn into martensite, and that's visible as, at this black phase here. Yes. So you see here uh, an example of what happens if I do not strain my austenite. Yeah? If I don't strain the austenite, the ferrite forms along the grain boundaries. Okay? So I let this happen, and I quench very early on in the transformation. Then the only ferrite I see, obviously, will be the one that's formed early on in the transformation, and that is grain boundary Nuclei, nuclei which have slightly grown. And you can see around the grain boundary and nothing inside the austenite grain. Yes? I deform a little bit, 0.12, yes? and I can already see that there are patches of austenite inside, excuse, patches of ferrite, of course, inside my austenite grain. And as I increase the strain, yes, I can see now that in addition to the grain boundary ferrite, I now form a lot more, yes, ferrite nuclei inside the, uh, uh, the grain. So I have found, as it were, a method to reduce the grain size of my austenite by doing the transformation not from this, but from this. Now, obviously, it can only work, yes, if you can deform the material, yes, and it should not transform. It, it, excuse me. Deforming it, and it shouldn't recrystallize, yes? And you should be able to deform more and more without recrystallization, right? That's essential. And I told you, it takes you less than one second to, to recrystallize material. So accumulating deformation is very difficult unless you add niobium. That is the importance of the uh, niobium. Okay, so remember that. We'll talk about this in the course a few more times because, uh, as I said, some plate products some uh, high-strength sheet products uh, make extensive use of this, uh, this, this method uh, to refine the microstructure. Um, and, uh, and it's wi very widely used uh, in, in, uh, in steel products. By the way, um, I also want to say that the amounts of niobium that you have to add are very, very small. Uh, Typical amounts of niobium are 0.04 mass percent or weight percent of uh, niobium around that. Yes, it, th this is not uh, the absolute uh, value for all grades, but that's the kind of typical value. Or 
Um, in other words, if I want to express it in ppms, 400 ppm is of niobium, okay? All right, so um, uh, this is a, um, a small uh, schematic to remind you of uh, what is the uh, effect of uh, different, of the main alloying elements. Have a look at it. If you ever need um, to remember, you know, what, what does chrome and moly have in general on uh, a TTT diagram and, and the transformations. Hmm? Um, what we can say in general, I'm, I'm just going to uh, go uh, over it quickly with you. Um, uh, I didn't talk too much about this uh, up to now, is that when you um, alloy steels, uh, in general, any alloying will depress the MS temperature. So it doesn't matter whether you add nickel or manganese or carbon, you will have a depression, depress the, the MS temperature will decrease. It's for all the elements, alloying elements, except two elements, cobalt and aluminum. Cobalt and aluminum will increase the MS temperature. Yeah. So uh, there are certain steels where it's very important to uh, have a MS temperature temperature that's high and those will be uh, commercial steels, those will be the steels where you see cobalt. Yes, this is so it's very important. Usually uh, we avoid adding cobalt uh, because it's a very expensive uh, uh, addition. Uh, but there are uh, uh, certain applications um, where uh, cobalt is, is added. Hmm? Uh, aluminum, uh, in general, um, uh, th there are actually, uh, currently there are some reasons to, to add aluminum to, to steels. Uh, but it's never really added to, to get to increase the MS temperature. Uh, but it, it, you, can, you can use the benefit of having a higher MS temperature. Um, further, we talked about uh, silicon, phosphorus, and aluminum suppressing the carbide formation. Yes. Uh, when do we make use of this? Well, we make use of it during the Bainite transformation. We do this to obtain what is called residual austenite. We'll talk about this as we talk about uh, benitic steels. And uh, that in certain cases, you want to have retained austenite rather than carbides in your bainite. And then you will have, you will, you'll use mainly silicon, in certain cases, phosphorus and aluminum. Uh, to get high uh, uh, volume fractions of retained austenite. Um, molybdenum has a very strong suppressing effect on the uh, perlite formation. Uh, chrome has a, suppresses the ferrite transformation, as we, we saw. Chrome and moly have a tendency to press down the BS temperature, things like this. And the niobium here, uh, does something that, uh, that is interesting in terms of processing uh, to get very fine uh, grain size. That's this, the C curve for the transformation to ferrite moves to the left. Okay, so that gives you uh, an idea, schematics, what is the impact of uh, alloying elements on transformation behavior. Um, now to, to wrap this up, I do want to uh, go through, through this um, important table, which basically uh, uh, puts uh, all of what I've said uh, into a very concise form. Hmm? Okay, so in general, of the elements uh, that we add to steels, carbon, uh, manganese, silicon, uh, chrome, vanadium, tungsten, titanium, etc. Um, we can always 
divide them into alpha stabilizers and gamma stabilizers. And very simple, if the gamma stability domain, uh, if you add that element and the gamma stability domain expands, we call it an austenite stabilizer. Yes? If we add that element and the uh, ferrite stabilizing domain expands, yes, we got this, we call this an alpha stabilizer. Hmm? Um, so, uh, so if you have a closed or a contraction, a closing or a contraction of the gamma field, hmm, gamma stability field, we call it alpha stabilizer. If we expand or we even open up the uh, gamma uh, region, stability region, we call it austenite stabilizer. Uh, so that element here, yes, uh, X uh, can be substitutional element hmm, with the exception of boron, which is interstitial. But I've told you already, boron has a rather complex way of doing things. Uh, it's also interstitial. Uh, people believe it's substitutional most of the time, but when it diffuses, it's an interstitial. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, what is the impact of an alpha stabilizer? Well, as I said, this line decreases. You add that element, it decreases, okay? What is the impact on, um, uh, of an alloying element? What's the importance, what, what do you want to look at, at, an, at, 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 at the, uh, uh, at the elements. What's, what's an important characteristic? There are two important characteristics. There's what is their, the impact they have on the transformation and do they or do they not form carbides? And, and how stable are the carbides? And what type of carbides we have? But that's a good thing. What's their impact on the transformation and the carbide formation? That's how you should look at it. Okay, so in general alloying will slow down transformations. Yeah? The, the, we, usually, uh, uh, when you get uh, austenite to ferrite, austenite to martin, we, we talk about austenite decomposition. It may seem, you don't decompose austenite when you make martensite, but you know, we still talk about austenite transformation, austenite decomposition. Okay. So, um, the effect of these uh, alpha stabilizer is to uh, retard the transformation even though they're ferrite stabilizers. Hmm? Hmm? Oh. And how does, what's the essence, what's the key mechanism for transformation retardation? It depends basically on, uh, on different effects. And so one possible effect is the element reduces the carbon diffusivity. So you know that when you make ferrite, yes, you need to rearrange the carbon. The carbon has to move to the austenite, yes, and away from the ferrite, okay? So uh, an element can have an impact on the diffusivity of the, uh, the carbon. Now you'll tell me, well, how does an element have an impact on the diffusivity because if say for instance carbon moves from one interstitial part to the, you know, if there is, well, another element can, uh, there can be a slight binding between carbon and that substitutional element. For instance, manganese likes to bind carbon. It doesn't form a carbide, they just, when, when carbon is close to a manganese atom, it will linger in the vicinity of the manganese atom. Yes, there is a slight binding, there attractive interaction. And that will, of course, <coughs> make the, the diffusivity of carbon drop in the presence of manganese, okay? So, that's, so diffusivity is retarded by um, attractive interactions, for instance. Second effect is the grain boundary can now be, can also be influenced by these alloying elements. You can, you can have a depletion of the grain boundaries or you can have an enrichment of the grain boundaries. Huh? And then typically, 
for instance, if you have uh, silicon, aluminum, chromium, they tend to, uh, in steels, they tend to uh, have a depletion or a uh, enrichment at the phase boundary. What do, what do I mean? Is that, well, when you do a transformation, okay, and you have alpha and gamma, yes, an element will have, a, for instance, chromium or silicon, will want to partition. It will want to partition. If it's a ferrite stabilizer, such as silicon, chrome, etc., one of the things it does at high temperature, it will um, move out of the, so for instance, chromium, it will move out of the austenite and into the ferrite. Yeah? So I will have a depletion of the carbon, uh, chromium, excuse me, chromium content, this chromium content, depletion of the chromium content at the interface, and here I will have an increase of the chromium content, yes? So I get, I have rearrangement of these atom concentrations, and so, uh, so that's another effect. And a third effect is solute drag. Uh, in this case, even if there's no partitioning, such as niobium, titanium, vanadium, uh, these elements will tend to accumulate at the boundary and slow down the transformation. So in the case of uh, these uh, solute drag, you have at the phase boundary an enrichment of that alloying element, yes? And the mobility of this boundary is strongly reduced by the presence of these atoms here. When this happens, we, we, we're talking about solute drag because the solute forces the boundary, the phase boundary, to move much more slowly. Because Right, so these three important uh, things. Carbide formation. Uh, so we have elements such as chrome, vanadium, moly, tungsten, titanium, niobium, and zirconium are very strong carbide formers. And we have different types of carbide formers. Carbide formers which form very stable and separate uh, carbide phases such as uh, titanium carbide, titanium, uh, niobium carbide, which are very much more stable than uh, cementite. So it doesn't matter how little the amount is of titanium or niobium that you add, they will always form niobium carbide, titanium carbide, before any cementite is formed. Type two carbide formers, those are the elements that will, when their concentration is low enough, yes, that will uh, substitute for iron atoms in the cementite. And so cementite in the presence of chrome, vanadium, and moly will contain chrome, vanadium, and moly if the concentration of these three elements is low enough. What is low enough? Well, a few tenths of a percent. So if you have, for instance, 0.2%, less than 1% of uh, these elements are present in a steel that, of course, contains carbon, you will see chrome carbides. Will not be formed, but you will have partitioning of the chrome to the uh, uh, cementite. And, and that process will be time and temperature dependent, okay? as we've seen last week. Um, in the industrial practice, our steels do not contain only carbon, but there is always some nitrogen present in our steel. Yes? In typical uh, sheet products, it will be of the order of 30 to 40 ppm of nitrogen. Yes? And it may be higher if, um, if we're talking about uh, uh, 
products that are fabricated by electric arc furnace. So there the levels can be about 100 ppm, easily two to three times the amount of nitrogen you get in the BOF route. Uh, in this case, the nitrogen will always be present in these carbides very often, and, and, and you get carbonitrides instead of carbides. So carbonitrides rather than pure carbides precipitate. Uh, and again, because in general, uh, for these carbides and carbonides, always remember that carbides form readily in ferrite because of the very low uh, solubility of carbon in ferrite. Okay? Nitrites, uh, molly and uh, tungsten don't form nitrites or carbonitrites, but uh, chrome, vanadium, titanium, and niobium and zircon form both very strong nitrites, uh, very stable nitrites, and carbonitrites. In particular, I want to stress the fact that the most effective way to stabilize or bind the nitrogen in steels is addition of titanium. It is uh, because titanium nitride forms actually in the liquid phase. So you can, that is the most effective way to neutralize the nitrogen as a nitride is by addition of uh, small amounts of titanium. About 100 ppm is sufficient. And then uh, some general things. Silicon, again, promotes formation of ferrites, uh, suppresses perlite formation, not because of its effect on ferrite in the perlite, but because it suppresses cementite formation. Um, chromium has an effect that we saw on the ferrite. Slight effect on the bainite tends to promote perlite. Um, and uh, molybdenum, as you remember, is very efficient when you want to uh, have benitic uh, structures. What about our austenite stabilizer? A little bit simpler uh, situation. The austenite stabilizers expand or open the gamma field. What elements are we talking about? Well, we talk about manganese, nickel, cobalt, and copper, uh, of which in Regular steel products, carbon steels, manganese is the most important one. And then we have interstitial elements, in this case, carbon and nitrogen. So, uh, so whereas there are no, uh, except maybe interstitial boron that are alpha stabilizers, the gamma uh, stabilizer, the main gamma, uh, gamma stabilizer is carbon and to lesser extent nitrogen. Um, again, you add these elements you always retard the transformation. Just as you retard, you usually retard the transformation when you add alpha stabilizers. And what, what's, what are the effects? Well, you, uh, the retardation is a delta G effect. Delta G effect means a free energy difference. Uh, if you make the the starting phase, the parent phase, more stable, you reduce the delta G from, for the reaction of gamma to alpha. Yeah? When you reduce the, uh, the, uh, the delta G, you reduce the driving force. So there will be less enthusiasm, if you want, for, to transform for the gamma phase. Second, any time you have to partition elements, yes, during the transformation, you will slow down the transformation, right? So just like, for instance, you need to partition chrome from gamma to alpha, yes, um, you need to partition nickel from alpha to gamma, and that will create a a um, diffusion uh, profile that has to be carried along with the transformation, yes? 
right? So partitioning of manganese, nickel, etc., uh, is important. And uh, note the cobalt is limited, is partitioning uh, rather limited. The partitioning of cobalt is rather limited. What can we say about carbides? Relatively simple. Uh, they usually don't form uh, carbides. And uh, manganese uh, is partitions to the uh, cementite. Yes, so you usually will find uh, in most steels that um, uh, manganese is present in the cementite. And um, it is interesting to know that uh, nickel does not enrich in the cementite. So it stays in solution, basically. All right. So uh, now we've talked about the, the elements as substitutional elements or uh, uh, interstitial elements, yes? Uh, when we also talked about carbides, yes? So uh, what is uh, what is important about carbide formation? Yeah? Um, well, you have to think about carbide formation or any form precipitation in the solid state, in the, in the steel, as being a chemical reaction, as being a chemical reaction. Oh. Ah, yeah, back. Right. Okay. So, say uh, this would be a chemical reaction of precipitation. This would be, for instance, niobium, yeah, with carbon, yeah, forming niobium carbide. I'm not very good at this. My handwriting is usually much better, but is it? Niobium carbide, okay? So this is a chemical reaction. You can think of the precipitation as a chemical reaction, right? So there, there is a delta G associated with it, which is, uh, so we use a traditional convention. That's the free energy of the product phase minus the free energy of the starting phases, the phases you started off with, hmm? and you know that uh, this can be rewritten as in this in this form, yes, where you have this last term here is R times temperature times natural logarithm of the activity of MC divided by the activity of M and the activity of X, and at equilibrium, yes, at equilibrium, uh, delta G is zero, and um, we can rewrite this uh, by putting the activity of a pure phase equal to 1 and assuming that the, for the activity we can use the concentrations of M and X rather than their activity, yes? And so, uh, right, so th this is a certain number, yes, this is a certain number, this, this will be uh, also, this is the gas constant, and this is the temperature, so uh, you can rewrite this as this. And for convenience, rather than using a natural logarithm, we, we, we convert to a, a log 10 base, and so you can rewrite logarithm of this, the product of m times x, so this product here is equal to a over t plus b. Right? That's usually how you will find solubility data for, for steels. Hmm? Next. All right. And, and, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this uh, these solubility uh, equations, if you want. Right? So uh, this is an example here for niobium carbide. Hmm? So log base 10, niobium content, carbon content, is equal to 2.26 minus 
6,770 divided by T, and T is in K. That's usually how you find this data, this solubility data. What does it mean? First of all, where is this equation on this graph? Well, this graph, you plot niobium and carbon, mass percent. And it goes from zero to higher values, yes? And from zero to higher value for the niobium, yes? This equation here is here. And so it's plotted for different temperatures. So as, as you change the temperature, yes? you will get different lines, yeah? okay? The other important uh, information uh, we have, uh, we, we uh, connect with uh, solubility equation, is the fact that we have stoichiometry of a compound. For instance, niobium and carbon form niobium carbide. So every time we take one niobium atom out of solution, we will also take one carbon atom out of solution. Hmm? Every time, in more general, every time we take one mole of niobium out of solution, we also take automatically one mole of carbon out of solution if we form NBC, niobium carbide, okay? So if this is an arbitrary composition, this point here, arbitrary composition, yes? That means that the solute the, compos the, 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 the solute content in the steel, yes, of the matrix will move along this line, al along the stoichiometric line. It, it, it cannot, it doesn't move in a random way because every time I take out one mole of niobium, yes, I automatically have to take out one mole of carbon, yes? So my composition, the matrix composition, always follows a composition line, yes? And the composition line is simply defined by the ratio of the molecular weights and, of course, the, the chemical formula of your compound. In this case, it's one, one niobium with one carbon, so I only have a uh, a, um, a, sl a slope that is dependent on the, the ratio of molecular weights. Okay, so at this point, maybe you still don't, you, you, you don't um, uh, understand the, the whole uh, system. L let's just um, look at this and add some colors to it. Okay. <coughs> yeah, it is. Okay, this is. The, first of all, what does the, the solubility line give you, right? So if I have a solubility line, so this is basically the same as what you just saw, except I only have the solubility line at 1250 degrees C, yeah? And uh, it divides my graph into a blue part and a red part, yes? So um, let's think about a steel composition, okay? Let, okay, let's think about the steel composition and imagine we have a steel which contains, say, uh, 100 ppm of carbon and uh, 200 ppm of niobium. Hmm? So this is 0 0.01 carbon, percent carbon, and this is 0.02 percent of niobium. So any composition, carbon and uh, niobium, I can, I can put on this gr diagram. So let's say, where is uh, O point, uh, the, yep. so uh, this is um, niobium, 
point one. So point uh, oh, oh five is here, right? That's half of that. And an oh point one is about here, yes. And uh, I have uh, oh point oh one carbon, oh point oh one carbon, that's here. Okay, so this is my, oops, this is about, this is where this composition is, here, yes? It's in the blue region. If you are in the blue region, below this line, your composition, the, the niobium and the carbon, is fully in solution, yes? If I had a different composition, say, uh, well, let's take the one that's, uh, that's shown here, which is about, uh, instead of uh, 0.02, 0.25 niobium, so much larger content of niobium, and uh, it's about 0 0.6, 0 0.06 uh, carbon. Yeah. Uh, these are unusually, uh, by the way, just between you and I, these are unusual compositions, yeah, but just for the example. Yeah? Uh, so we have 0 0.5 and 0 0.05 here, or approximately. Right? So in this case, my steel composition, say, is close to this one here, yes? It's in the red region, yes? This means that at this high level of carbon and niobium, there will be partial precipitation of the niobium and carbon as niobium carbide. And how much of the niobium is, in, is precipitate and how much is in solution, can, you can very simply determine it graphically. Hmm? And that's shown here. So uh, this is an example here where I have 0, 0 0.11 niobium and 0 0.1 carbon, this is a very high composition, composition. so usually you, you, you don't have this much, but um, so this is the steel composition. The steel matrix composition will move along the stoichiometric line to the solubility line, yes? Why does it move along there? Because it cannot do anything else. The, every time you remove a certain amount of niobium, you have to remove uh, an equal number of carbon atoms from the solution. So you always move along the solubility line, yes, until you hit this line. There's no reason for further decrease in the, mang in the niobium content uh, in the matrix because any, uh, uh, from this point on, the niobium and the carbon are soluble in uh, this gamma at 1250. So this is the amount of niobium that will be present as niobium carbide, yes? And the rest, this is, this is the total amount, this is niobium total, yeah? This is the total amount of niobium. Um, so in the rest is, is what will remain in, sol in the in solid uh, form. Hmm? Uh, we were talking earlier about the steels that are thermomechanically alloyed. What's, what, where are they on this graph? We typically have about uh, 0.1 and they're, they're typically located here. Yeah? The, and the contents of carbon 
uh, can go as low as this. So depending on the concentration, yes, you will get uh, a little bit, a little bit or a little bit more niobium precipitating as the temperature decreases. So, so again, this is just an example uh, which you will not encounter much in, in practice. Um, usually, the, as I said, the niobium levels are about this, and the carbon levels are certainly less than 0.1 in these steels. So in, again, uh, the, the slides, as I said earlier, uh, have uh, contain a lot of um, data. This, this, this is a number of um, uh, data uh, values for uh, A and B in the solubility equation for carbides. The solubility of carbides is different in austenite and ferrite. Yes. So always be careful uh, when you're using uh, this data. Nitrides have so precipitate and you have different solubility products for the nitrides and the carbides and the solubility is different again of nitrides in austenite and ferrite. But one of the things as a rule Yes, the solubility of nitrides and carbides in ferrite is many, many times lower than in uh, austenite. So when you do the transformation, yes, when you transform austenite to ferrite, suddenly there is a big surge, usually a big surge in precipitation, yes, because of the much lower solubility of these carbides and the ferrites in the uh, in the austen in the excuse me in the ferrite. Okay, so this this is how things happen. For instance, this is the uh, temperature dependence of solute niobium. It, this is a very realistic uh, calculation. So I have 400 ppm of niobium okay. at high temperatures. It's fully in solution. Yeah. And then I hit the solubility temperature, T solubility, solubility temperature, which turns out to be 1150. And then the titanium uh, carbide starts to precipitate. Yes? It doesn't precipitate all of it suddenly, massively, right? It precipitates gradually. Hmm? So uh, it will reduce from 400 ppm to 50 ppm, going from about 1200, 1150 to 900, yes? If I were to plot further, in, because this is austenite, below uh, 900 I have ferrite, then the solubility would actually, on this scale, drop to almost zero, yes? So during the transformation, there is a, a surge in precipitation of the niobium. Hmm? We'll see when we start uh, talking about uh, uh, processing of steels that uh, before we uh, roll or we uh, uh, you know, roll steel or we make bar or we make wire, we usually have to reheat slabs or billets. Uh, and, uh, and these are typical reheating temperatures, 1200 to 1300. And you can see that uh, this temperature is not uh, chosen lightly. It's actually very important. It's chosen to make sure that before you start the processing, all the important precipitates are in solution. Yes? so that you can use the precipitation during the processing of the material. So for instance, this effect here, you need to have niobium in solution, yes? So you, you need to reheat to temperatures which are above the solubility temperature, okay? So now uh, we've talked about um, 
general about steels, about the, the composition, uh, and about how the composition impacts the transformation. And again, I'm not going to go into this because uh, too much the physical metallurgy because we, we focus on products and I assume you, um, you just need a refresher at this stage. Now we want to say a few things about how composition affects not structure but mechanical properties. Yeah? And um, what's interesting with steels is that you can have materials, the same base alloy steels, you know, carbon, uh, sorry, uh, iron based alloys, uh, which have very wide uh, strength ranges. And um, the um, pure iron actually, yield strength of pure iron is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, is, is around, is in this region here. Around 60 MPa. Yeah. So actually, it's nothing very strong of a material, basically, iron, pure iron. Yeah. However, uh, most of the uh, steels we use, tensile strength, we easily achieve for the softest one about 200 megapascal tensile strength. And Uh, coal drawn steel wires yes, can reach up to 3 gigapascal okay a and these are materials that are not exceptional okay you can just go ahead and buy this material yes you can buy many tons of it uh, so this is this, this, I'm not talking about exceptional materials here. So you can go, you, you have basically alloys which, which go from very soft in tensile strength to very hard. And the amount of alloying we use is actually minimal, right? I can tell you that uh, the, the surface material has close to one and a half percent of alloying elements and, and the, the cold drone has maybe a little bit over 2% of alloying elements. Am I saying this right? Yeah, less than 3%. So it's amazing what a range of properties, mechanical properties you can achieve with virtually a pure iron, you know, close to a pure iron matrix, okay? Very interesting. So, and the reason why it works is, oops, time is up. You'll have to wait till Wednesday after the quiz to know the answer to this question. All right? Good.